So here I'm going to talk about the savings investment model or the loanable funds model using an intermediate macroeconomics. In this case, I'm going to talk about how it works in the open economy. And this is the, the fourth of six planned videos on the basic models of intermediate macroeconomics. So first we're going to decide, or we're going to define what an open economy is. And in this sense, an open economy allows for free movement of capital to and from other countries, right? You can talk about openness to trade where goods move back and forth. Um, in this case, we're talking about purely capital movements. Now, uh, we also assume that capital is perfectly mobile, which is probably not true. There are barriers to capital movements, um, and that sometimes affects how well the model works. But, um, but in this case, we're just going to assume that there's one big market for capital that, that determines interest rates worldwide. There's going to be a single global or world price for capital. There's going to be a single world interest rate, as opposed to the national interest rate. And so earlier we talked about the closed economy. Um, in that case, each country would have its own interest rate based on supply and demand for capital. Here, here, there's going to be what would happen if the country were closed, but there's going to be a world market, um, the world interest rate that's determined by all countries pooled together. All right, and so the closed economy is good to get a good sense of it. The U.S. is an open economy. Uh, like I said, the, the world economy is not completely open, but capital is allowed to move across borders, and that's going to allow countries to, to save and borrow versus other countries in the world. Right? So what this means for savings and investment is that in the closed economy, savings has to equal investment. The source of funds has to equal the use of funds. And so if a country wants to invest, wants to add capital, build machinery, build railroads, or whatever, it has to come up with the money through its own savings. And that does not happen, especially for, for poorer countries that don't have much money left over to save. So if they're going to build those railroads, build uh, you know the highways, they're going to need to get that money from someone else's savings, right? so they can borrow from other countries. And so in an open economy, you could have savings higher than investment. Some countries are going to lend. They have extra savings and they want to earn money, right? earn interest. So they can lend it to countries who invest more than they save. And so you could actually have welfare increase because some countries, and in the real world, it could be a country like Germany, saves more um, that, and then probably, you know, it can afford to invest, right? Germany has a lot of capital, so it can send capital to other countries. Then you can have a borrowing country that takes those savings, and uh, this is their own internal savings is low. How do they fuel that investment? They do it through um, borrowing from abroad. All right, so some countries are lenders over here. Some countries are borrowers. Right? And so what that is called is the current account. Right? The current account is a measure of international borrowing. Sometimes in a macro context, you can call it net exports, which is exports minus imports, but it's not quite identical. There's another item called net factor payments, and that's actually payments to and from um, other countries that are based for the use of factors. And so one example that I would think about is if Apple, for example, um, designs the iPhone in America but produces it in China, they're going to earn profits in China. They, they could be Chinese exports, but the net factor payments, or those, the, the payments for the, the capital and stuff, go to the United States. And so that would be part of, it's Chinese exports, but it actually could be part of an in-payment for to the U.S. All right? And so the current account is different from net exports for the same reason that GDP and GNP are different. Okay? And so I'm going to assume here that net factor payments are zero, so the current account is equal to net exports. That is true for many countries, but some countries do have a big uh, discrepancy between the two items. I'm also going to assume that government spending is zero, and there's going to be no taxes and no government spending. And so how we can show that the current account um, or is related to net exports and savings minus imports goes over here. So without any taxes, every dollar earned for income has to equal consumption plus saving. There's basically two places to put your money, consume it or save it. That's one equation for the consumer's decision. And then for the GDP equation, you have Y equals C plus I plus X minus M. Remember, G is gone. All right, so these are equal to each other. So you can say C plus S is equal to C plus I plus X minus M. All right, so Y is Y that disappears, so they're equal to each other. Notice that C drops out on both sides. And then you're going to have S equals I plus X minus M. If you bring it over to the left side, you can have S minus I equals X minus M. All right, and so there's a relationship between this international lending and borrowing and being a net exporter or a net importer. So a country like Germany, again, has extra savings, sends the money abroad. That's also represented by the fact that Germany is a net exporter. They send goods abroad. Right, and so this is in a lending context, and this is in a net exports context, context, and they're equal. So Germany could, and I always think of it as like they they send the railroad trains to another country, and uh, that country will have, you know, they're the exporter, the other country's the importer. They will actually import the capital through the import of the railroad trains. Right, so that's one way to look at it. All right, so. 
We're going to talk about this lending taking place at a certain price, and that's the world interest rate. Again, assume capital is perfectly mobile. There are legal and other information restrictions. People do not invest abroad. They talk about what's called the home bias. People are biased toward investing at home. They, you know, most If you have a savings account, it's at a local bank. You don't have the information or the risk tolerance to put your money in a different state's bank, maybe. Or you might not be willing to invest it abroad because you could lose money. So people don't really put their capital perfectly around the world to seek the highest profit people do uh, they fall victim to information asymmetries and risk and things like that but we can assume that there's one big pool of capital that there's all say world world savings and all world investment are in one market and then the price is the world price so world supply and world demand are determined at what I call RW or the world interest rate now for a small country right you've got your own interest rate for SNI but that could be higher or lower than the world price and so if you have a very expensive capital you can borrow from abroad at a lower rate or if you have very cheap capital, you're right, your investors don't want to earn low interest at home. They can send it abroad at a higher rate. So there's going to be two interest rates. So we can go back to this uh, model. This is our loanable funds market or the savings investment model. For the individual country, you have savings and investment equal at this qu single quantity. And they have a single, and uh, this is the domestic interest rate. That's uh, where those intersect. But if you have a lower world interest rate, right, for whatever reason, there's more capital, uh, you know, this country has whatever, a low, maybe maybe they have, uh, you know, different savings rate, or maybe their marginal productivity of capital is different or something, but their interest rate is higher than the world price, countries could actually use this price, okay? And so what that means is if you're an investor, you want to invest more, so it's going to increase investment put. But at the same time, it crowds out savings. There's going to be, it's going to discourage savings. There's going to be less saving at the world interest rate. There's going to be more investment. And then this gap here, right, there's a, these are no longer the same. Investment is high and savings is low. And then you wind up with this gap being the current account. So this is a current account deficit. This negative current account represents international borrowing. This country is going to borrow at a low interest rate because they can tap into world markets, get capital cheaper than they could at home, and then they're going to take that low rate, they're going to invest more, save less, and finance that gap through borrowing. Okay? Now we can go back here, and what if we add a certain, so this is where we're at, we're going to add a shock. Okay, so we talked about savings shocks uh, before, let's introduce a negative savings shock here. And what happens here is that this country, for whatever reason, uh, maybe government spending went up, um, then they're going to need to borrow more to finance that government spending. People talk about that in the U.S. a lot. It's kind of a trope. Um, you know, government deficits are financed through China or something like that. Well, in this case, there's going to be less savings. Saving shifts left. Here was our original investment. Here's, here's going to be this less saving here. And again, this doesn't move. And that's important because if you talk about small versus large open economies, we're assuming that this is a small country. And whatever goes on in the country does not change the world price. A large open economy does have um, an impact on the world price. Right? If the U.S. starts borrowing more, it's going to affect world interest rates. Right? But a tiny country would not see that. Right? So this does not change. Okay? So it just simply says, you know, this country saves less. And as they save less, they're going to borrow more. And at the same given price, the current account deficit is bigger right, than it was before. And so the negative supply shock, less savings, simply means that there's going to be more borrowing and the current account deficit widens. All right. Now let's look at a current account surplus. Right now here, the world interest rate is higher than the domestic interest rate, and so savers can send their money abroad and earn more money. But investors are going to face competition, and they're not going to be able to invest as much because capital is more expensive. Right. So here you have high savings and low investment. They're no longer the same again. Savings is greater than investment. The current account is positive. That is a current account surplus. So this is the lending country where capital is cheap at home and expensive abroad. And so savers are going to earn more money. Investors are going to invest less. Now if we bring back that same negative supply shock, okay, so this is a, a negative supply shock on the uh, savings, current account surplus just got smaller. All right, so this country, because they're saving less, they have less money to send abroad. All right, I can narrow it all the way to zero. I could go further and turn them from a lender to a borrower. But here I just made a large surplus into a small surplus. All right? So that's for the small open economy. Right? A small economy does not affect the price. And that's important because sometimes small countries are tiny islands or they have few people. Here it simply has to do with the effect on world markets. 
So here we're going to have a large economy. We're going to actually see the world interest rate change. Okay, So that's what makes a large economy. It affects the world price. So what I have here is two countries, to make it simple. Here is a country with a deficit. Here is a country with a surplus. And these arrows are the same length. This is the price that means that this country's borrowing is exactly the same as this country's lending. If there's no third country, this there can only be the same amount here as here. All right, if this country is borrowing a billion dollars, they have to get a billion dollars here. This gap has to be a billion dollar surplus. They each have their own interest rates at uh, you know, the, in their respective countries, but because they're pooling their capital, they're going to find that uh, one country can lend or borrow to the other. All right, so the deficit at home, I call this the home country, which is H, is equal to the surplus in foreign, and so they actually benefit from this. And I want to make that point again. There, in, in economics, we talk about lending and borrowing as being mutually beneficial. Right? This this borrowing is funding productive capital projects at home. This this lending is, is being a profit to investors at home. The capital was not doing this country as much good at home at low benefit as it is going to do abroad. And so just like any lending transaction, um, economics would talk, you know, basic principles would say that lending and borrowing is actually good for both sides, right? It's not exploitative. It's it's uh, funding useful projects in one country, and um, the pro these projects are more useful, which is why they pay more, than they were in the other country. Okay, so this is mutually beneficial, right? And that's why we talk about economic integration being positive, and we punish people by cutting them off from capital markets. Or we assume that integration is good, and, and uh, under under you know perfect circumstances, of course. But we assume that that integration is good, and autarky can be bad. Most countries want to join the world market and don't want to be cut off, right? So this is productive, right? They're pooling their capital, and it's benefiting both sides. All right. Um, and what will happen, though, is that if something ha changes in one or the other country, it's going to change the, this world interest rate. It can actually go up and down. It's, um, if you think about it in terms of perfect competition from a principle of micro, these, this is no longer a price taker. This country is actually a price maker. Okay? So we're going to have a negative supply shock at home, and we're going to see that the world interest rate rises. In other words, there's less savings. It's going to push the price up, and that's what you'd expect in economics. right? If there's less of something you want more of it, you have to pay more for it. So this negative shock is going to do two things at once. It is going to widen the current account like we did before, but it's not going to widen it as much because this country is large enough where if there's less savings, that means that the world supply, the world pool of capital actually will decrease. And so the world pool of capital gets scarcer and it's going to cost more. And so instead of widening it all the way to here, it's going to widen it somewhat. All right. And, it, and so, but it's at the same time, it's going to push the world price up a little bit. And what that also means is that it's going to push the price up in the other country because they're going to, you know, react to the, the higher world price by saving a little more and investing a little bit less. Okay, so the large com country actually has an effect on these, uh, the, its partner as well. Now, in the real world, there might be certain large countries like the U.S., China, uh, Britain might be a little large in some senses, even though it's kind of small physically, it might be larger economically. Um, but uh, it's really you might have a number of you know large countries and a number of small countries. Not every country, it, like in this case, there's two large countries. But in in a lot of cases, one country's you know it, whatever happens in that country actually affects the small neighbors. Right. So here they're both affected. But you can see what a large country does. Right. The negative shock does increase the current account, but it also raises the world price as well. All right, so that's what we did. We introduced the op the open economy second, uh, as a you know, to the closed economy. So in a previous lecture, we did the the closed economy. We didn't have any in, uh, borrowing or lending, but then we opened the economy to capital flows, and we saw that the current account, right, the fifth of the six variables, is is determined, right. And so for a small economy, we, we showed surpluses and and, and deficits, um, and we showed how shocks. To the curves, right? It shifts in the curves, shocks to the economy can lead to changes in the current account. It can get larger and get smaller, right? And then we talk about the closed economy, and we, the, uh, or the, excuse me, the small open economy. Then for a large open economy, we went in and we uh, talked about what makes it large. It can affect the price, can raise or lower the world price. Um, and in this case, it's the price of capital or the world interest rate. And then the same shock, right? A negative uh, savings shock. Um, did increase the current account somewhat, the current account deficit somewhat, but it also affected world interest rates. Right? And so now we have uh, you know, one model, we can determine R, but we can also do the current account. So now, now we've been talking about one of the open economy variables. The next one is the exchange rate, and I, I uh, talk about that in terms of the interest rate parity model.
right? But in terms of an intermediate macro, the current account gets a lot of attention. It's important for U.S. policy. And here we can talk about how savings and investment decisions lead to changes, increases, or decreases in the current account.